We're live. Here we All are. Right. I got my coffee. <laughs> coffee needed. With, this is Dave. For me. I, can't I have Colin with me tonight, you guys. We are already getting so many good questions. So Colin, what is your last name, Colin? Oh, Stray Jack. Sorry, I didn't want to fill up the whole thing. Uh, I like this better. Yeah. I like this, yes, because you are the modern day overthinker. And we got the sign behind you that's up. It fell earlier, it but we fell got it. earlier. Yeah. There, <laughs> I need to no get a better, uh, call is gonna go. better adhesive to fix that. So. Yeah. So, guys, so my name is Jenna. Welcome to our Monday webinar. We're here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. Um, I try to have a, an awesome, fun guest with me. Um, and tonight, that is Colin, otherwise known as Modern Day Overthinker or MD Overthinker on Instagram. Um, we did a live together, one or two lives together. I feel like back when, like in the pits of COVID. <laughs> yeah, this was like, like, it was still cold outside. I know that. It was, it was still really, really cold. I remember I was like bundled up by my fireplace. Um, so yeah, and I thought that it would be great to have him back on, um, have him on here rather, and share a little bit about his story, get his feedback on um, kind of his take on OCD and anxiety related things, and, and we'll try to answer some of your questions. Um, so yeah, Colin, why don't you just give me like a quick, give us like a quick little rundown of kind of who you are, where people can find you to learn more about you. Yeah, so uh, I'm Colin. Yeah, my last name is Stray Jack. Um, I'm used to doing the Colin S thing. I think that's a recovery thing, um, anonymous. But uh, basically, uh, I started Modern Day Overthinker. I'm a mental health advocate. Uh, so I started it because I struggle with uh, a couple different things, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder being one of them, uh, as well as major depressive disorder. So I wanted to have an outlet to share my experience and share, you know, what I have been able to do to combat the issues that I have and, you know, the stuff that I have to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, I've used this platform, the Modern Day Overthinker platform, uh, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, uh, the website is moderndayoverthinker.com that has all the links. That's the easiest way to get to everything. I basically have a button for everything on there. Uh, so, yeah, I was diagnosed with OCD when I was, uh, it was between 13 and 14. I don't remember exactly. Uh, so right at that, pu pre at that pubescent stage, basically becoming going into puberty and a lot of things changing at once. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting time for me. So I didn't really understand what was going on, uh, as well as, uh, my parents who have been very helpful throughout this experience, but you know, we didn't really, I don't have any family members who have this. So basically it just, uh, came out of nowhere and I was having a lot of, uh, a lot of racing thoughts, a lot of, uh, basically I was tricking myself into believing that I was doing all these bad things. And, uh, and then I would try to develop obviously compulsions to avoid doing those bad things. One of those was I didn't talk for like a month at school and I was actually a very social person. Uh, I like to be kind of a class clown. I was always joking around and, uh, you know, I had a pretty good group of friends and I just all of a sudden stopped talking to everyone because it was a fear of me getting in trouble at school and, uh, you know, having to deal with being punished at home, uh, things like that. Uh, so it started off uh, with just a lot of fear. I didn't understand a lot of unknown things. So I started going to a psychiatrist and they were able to diagnose me. And uh, I've been, uh, OCD is a lifelong thing and it's something I've been dealing with ever since. Mm -hmm. You're talking now. Yeah, exactly. Here we are. It was just, it was just a month. It was like a month and a half. Uh, and it was just like, not completely out of character. People were very confused and very concerned. Uh, 
but it was the only thing I could think of to, you know, ease my anxiety. It didn't really help very well. I was still obviously just completely, mm -hmm. basically out of my mind, just not understanding what was going on at all, just because it came out of nowhere. And I was pretty happy go lucky for the most part before. And then that happened and my life has not been the same since, but uh, I believe it's helped me grow into a better person. And I learned a lot uh, over the years and continue to learn because it's something I have to continue to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I mean, I, it always makes me so happy to, to see advocates who have recovered so nicely and are, and are recovering. Um, but it, but it, it is, it's like a lifestyle, right? You have to, just change the relationship that you have with it. And um, yeah, I, I love having you guys here because I feel like it's such good perspective. Um, I have lived experience with OCD too, but I feel like my therapist side like so automatically comes out because uh, that's just what I do all day. It's what I've mm -hmm. done all day, every day for the past 12 years. Yeah. So I feel like I have to actively remind myself during these webinars to be like, oh wait, you do actually have a story. Like you do actually have like some personal uh, background here that you could give, but it's just so easy for the therapist piece to roll off for like advocates who they, they, they are lived experiences of it. It's just really mm -hmm. valuable to have you here. So I love yeah, that. I'm, like, I'm always, always happy to, to share my experience and, you know, put myself out there. Uh, even though I, you know, don't like being on camera at all, actually. I Me neither. Everyone always is like, Jenna, do you like being on camera? And I'm like, no, I just fake it really well. Like, it just, it's something that I value and I have to do it. So I think it just goes to show that you can, you can feel anxious and still do it anyway. Right. So that's kind yeah. of the whole point. Yeah. So awesome. Colin, thank you so much for being here. I'm super stoked to have you. So let's get into some questions. Yeah, um, there's a lot flowing. So. Yeah, let's go. So just a heads up, you guys. I don't ignore any of your questions. I can't possibly get to all of them. Um, but hint, hint, I do try to find ones that are generalizable, like across subtypes to everybody. Um, I try hard as much as I can to not provide reassurance. So um, with that said, yeah, trying to keep things general here so that they can be helpful to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so... A little bit of a loaded question, but I feel like we can take this a lot of good directions. So yeah. Andrea, hello, hello. How can you manage your triggers that make you scared and afraid? So kind of like what Colin and I were talking about, right? Like whether we're triggered by, you know, wanting to talk or not wanting to talk rather. Um, if we're triggered by being on camera, triggered by driving, triggered by certain images, whatever the triggers are, um, know that they're specific to you and that's okay. And that OCD treatment, anxiety treatment is, can be helpful regardless of what your triggers are. Um, so I would first and foremost start by just identifying and, and kind of getting acquainted with some of what those triggers are for you, just being vigilant for them, maybe like monitoring them a little bit, taking some notes about what those triggers are. And then not to sound like I'm beating a dead horse or anything, but I'm obviously going to suggest some form of exposure and response prevention. So um, finding some way in a gradual way that's challenging but still manageable for you to challenge yourself with those triggers, right? So like Colin, at some point he chose to talk again, right? So it, it probably at some point felt very uncomfortable, felt like he was you know, doing something irresponsible or that there was gonna be some consequence associated with that, but he did it anyway. Um, probably because he had to, right? Like it came down to, I, I either live with this fear and I continue not talking or I sacrifice all my relationships. I don't get what I want at this restaurant because you have to talk, like you have to talk if you want yeah. to live a life, right? So, um, so my suggestion very generally is going to be to become acquainted with your triggers. Just try to get an understanding of them because I always say you can't hit a target that you can't see. Um, so just see the targets. Um, and then if you are working with a therapist, that's great. Try to do some exposure and response prevention to gradually approach those triggers in a manageable and challenging way. Um, and try to resist the safety behaviors that you're used to doing to keep yourself safe, right? So um, 
maybe uh, before I get on camera, I need to say a prayer 15 times, right? I don't, but if that was something that I needed to do because getting on, on camera triggered me, but I felt like I needed to pray 15 times before I did it, it would come down to not only getting on camera more, it would come down to trying to resist those praying rituals or whatever those other safety behaviors might be. So basically just finding ways to reduce the avoidance that you have around those triggers, trying to purposefully um, and gradually put yourself in those situations to expose yourself in a challenging but manageable way and trying to reduce the safety behaviors that you have because ultimately you think that they're making you safe, but like Colin said, by him not talking, he thought that it was gonna be helpful, but he ended up just being more anxious, right? Like you were just more anxious plus not talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it arbitrarily, by doing these safety behaviors, it kind of arbitrarily makes you feel like you're keeping yourself safe, but rea reality sets in and you realize that you're not keeping yourself safe, you're actually just making things worse. Yep. It's a very, well, it's a short term thing. Uh, it's a short term solution. You think anyway, your brain tricks you into it being a short term solution. But uh, yeah, like you said, recognizing the triggers and knowing them and understanding what they are and also practicing uh, doing the opposite of what you want to do, which is avoid those triggers and uh, walking through basically dealing with OCD uh, the right way is you have to walk, walk through fire basically and face your fears head on. Otherwise they're going to continue, continue to haunt you and weigh you down. Uh, so it sounds a lot easier than it is. Uh, I know that for a fact, because uh, I'm struck. See the way my OCD works is I go from certain uh, compulsions and certain fears to another new fear that I create. And then it starts the cycle all over again. So I'm working with a different different fear right now. Uh, mostly it's more of a, a harm fear where I feel like I'm gonna harm someone. And uh, I'd have a lot of compulsions involved and it could be like nobody's even near me and I could still be scared that I'm gonna harm someone somehow. Or someone thinks that I'm trying to harm someone, that's another part of it. There's a bunch of layers that I've built uh, so basically understanding that that's not really you, that that's your, uh, that's your OCD and your OCD is basically kind of like a bully that's trying to take you down and you basically have to, uh, I think I described it one time as like fighting the bully after lunch. So it doesn't take your lunch money anymore kind of thing. Um, and just standing up for yourself because it's going to continue to be a, constant battle and um the avoidance just makes things worse it really does uh and it makes it more of a habit and the habit's obviously a lot harder to break yeah because every time and I'm, i mean i avoid things i'm human i avoid things all the time okay. like it's just life right so every time you avoid it's go whether it's conscious or not whether it's subtle or super super obvious if you avoid a trigger you are going to consciously or not be telling yourself, oh, good thing you avoided that because otherwise something bad would have happened, right? So whether we call into work because we're anxious, whether we don't say hi to that person because we're anxious, whether we walk the other way because we're anxious about what could be down this aisle or whatever, if we avoid and if we give into those, those things, Consciously or not, we are giving into that notion that good thing you avoided that because otherwise you wouldn't have been able to handle it and otherwise something bad would have happened yep. because otherwise why would you have avoided it, right? Um, and that's kind of the end of, that's like the last little portion of the OCD cycle. So those compulsions, that relief that you get from those compulsions, it negatively reinforces additional intrusive thoughts and additional doubts in the future. So yep. um, super super good information and andrea i hope i say i'm saying your name correctly but i'm super proud that this person got help and that they're starting to feel a little bit better this makes my whole night this makes me super super happy so i'm super glad um and so i'm gonna skip here i do want to come back to teaching to the choir so teaching to the choir i will come back to your question but just because this is such a good segue colin to what we just talked about um how to know from Brittany. 
uh, how to know the difference between a thought slash feeling from OCD or reality. And I was literally just having this conversation with someone today. I've never, with the hundreds, if not thousands of people who, probably hundreds, of, I've, of people who I've worked with with OCD in the past 12 years, no one has ever said to me, I know 100% that this is completely false and completely not real. Yeah, no one has ever said that. <laughs> otherwise, it wouldn't be a problem. Right. So whether it's fear of COVID, fear of hitting someone with your car, fear of being attracted to children, fear of harming someone, other people thinking that you could have harmed someone, no matter what it is, that's why OCD is so maddening to you and to everyone else who's here, right? OCD is so maddening because it does make you doubt reality and fear, right? It feeds off of it. Yeah. And so it's going to convince you. It's going to make you feel like that 0.00001% of your uncertainty. Like, I know that I didn't hurt anybody, but I, I just, I, I'm not, I'm 99.99999% sure that I couldn't have hurt someone, but that's not, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough for the OCD. No matter what your subtype is, no matter what the fear is, no matter what the thought is, it's never going to be enough. So you can be 0.00001% unsure and that 0.0001% is still going to feel so real and feel so like the stakes are so high. So it's going to feel irresponsible. It's going to feel like a total leap of faith and you need to resist the rituals anyway. You're never going to know first that this isn't real and then resist your rituals, right? Like you're never gonna feel better and then resist your rituals. You have to resist your rituals first and address the avoidance and walk into the fire like Colin is saying, and then you'll hopefully feel better, but it's not gonna work the other way around. If people felt better before these things started to change, then I, we, I wouldn't have a job, right? Like Colin, you wouldn't have to do all the advocacy that you do because people would just feel better, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, think? the doubt is the biggest thing, uh, is OCD loves doubt and uh, loves feeding off of that. Uh, so what I try to do is uh, do like thought recognition, recognize what's truly how I feel and how not only necessarily how I feel, but how I want to feel and how I really uh feel about that situation and what actually happened. And I mean, sometimes uh, if it's not too ridiculous of something that you think might have happened, uh, it's good to check with somebody. Say you thought you hit somebody with your car and there was somebody with you. I mean, check with them um, as a reassurance. But uh, you don't have to get to that point. Uh, the main thing is uh, you have to build confidence in yourself and knowing the difference between what you are actually feeling and how you actually feel and how OCD wants you to feel, basically. And it takes practice, it takes therapy, it takes time. Uh, but yeah, definitely work with somebody and talk to somebody about it. Um, especially somebody like Jenna who can help you work through those thoughts mm -hmm. and understand and they'll be able like my therapist to be like, dude, you know, that's not real. Or like, he'll call me out and tell me like these things. And it's like that reassurance helps me because a lot of my stuff is, um, you know, very repetitive and the same things that I believe that might be real happening over, and over and over again. And they're never, uh, you know, 90, 9.9% .9 of the time, I know for a fact that, you know, they're not real and it's not something that I actually am feeling or want to feel, mm -hmm. but it's tricky. It is. It's not easy, but the therapy helps and reassures you that, you know, you're not crazy and that you're, you know, your mind is trying to play tricks on you. Is mm -hmm. what it down to. And, and one big part of exposure and response prevention one big reason why it does work kind of one of the underlying models behind it is called the inhibitory learning model so the inhibitory learning model basically says that exposure and response prevention works because you replace basically because you learn 
is a fancy way of saying that. Basically, you learn that your thoughts aren't real. <laughs> um, yes. So I can't tell you how many moms I've worked with who like felt who had a lot of intrusive thoughts that they were a bad mom, that they like to hurt their child, or that they would do this, or that this would happen. They put themselves in these anxiety-provoking situations, and I don't know whether they're a good mom or a bad mom. Obviously, I know that they're a good mom. I can sense that they're a good mom. But we put them in these anxiety-provoking situations to be alone with their baby, to have knives out around their baby, to go driving with their baby or whatever. And they learn that their anxiety can, can come down, that they don't necessarily have to do anything about that. They learn that they can tolerate time alone with their baby and that everything was for the was okay. Maybe it was uncomfortable, but it wasn't dangerous. And so only from that experience, by walking into the fire, like Colin said, only then do you start to have those what we call corrective experiences where you can start to realize that what you previously thought was very, very scary and very, very real and very possible you come out of that exposure and you're like, wait, that actually didn't happen. That ac uh, actually didn't happen the way that I thought it was going to. Like that actually went way better than I thought that it was going to go. And only then do you start to s develop that distinction between what's real and what's not. But again, you have to challenge yourself first. Um, and practically that comes in the form of doing these exposures, putting yourself in these anxiety provoking situations, and really importantly, trying to reduce and stop doing those compulsive behaviors. Awesome. So already promised I'd go back to this question. Colin, don't think you're going to be able to talk about postpartum <laughs> hormones very much, but let me know if you have any things. <laughs> nope, not really. Sorry. <laughs> Is it common for hormonal fluctuations to increase OCD and anxiety? I notice mine is worse during hormonal shifts. Um, yes, I do a lot of work with moms postpartum. So totally, totally a thing. So they've done lots of research to show, um, and I would try to find the link and post it for you guys, but I don't want to mess up my stream yard. Um, maybe I'll post it in the no CD page on Instagram after this, but they've done lots of research to show that this is very higher um, and more, uh, Severe symptoms are associated with like those uh, certain ovulation times, um, certain times in the month for women, um, namely like leading up to their period. So like the week before their period tends to be just more uh, dramatic increases in their OCD and um, their anxiety, depression. Um, and I see it. I see it with a lot of my members. They tend to like every every three or four weeks. Yep, just they they could know all the skills. They can be great students and just totally kicking butt. And then all of a sudden they're like, I just don't know what it is. I don't feel like myself. I feel like a terrorist has like hijacked my brain. I just don't feel like myself. Like it, it's as though everything that I've taught them, they just like can't access it. And so during those times, like, first of all, I think just educating yourself and knowing that that is part of, of the, of the hormonal shifts and, you know, it, it definitely can lead to those increase in that increase in urges. Um, but if you have established this as a as a kind of pattern for you, you can kind of see it coming. Just because you have higher urges doesn't necessarily mean that you need to retreat, that you need to give in to all these urges, that you need to submit to all of them. You can just know that it's coming. Give yourself some compassion, of course, like give yourself some leniency. It doesn't mean give yourself permission to ritualize for everything but definitely give yourself compassion for, you know, not being perfect with your exposure work, not being able to resist every ritual perfectly like you would want to. Um, so, but still, still know that this is coming and know that this is a pattern and it's not you, it's nothing wrong with you. It's nothing wrong with how you're approaching treatment. It has a lot to do with hormonal shifts. Um, that's why a lot of women struggle postpartum. Um, has everything to do too with the adjustment to motherhood, which is super complicated in and of itself, but hormonal shifts too. It happens with breastfeeding. It happens when you wean from from breastfeeding. All of these periods of time are associated with um, heightened periods of difficulty when it comes to OCD, anxiety, and other related symptoms. So nothing wrong with you, nothing wrong um, with your approaching thing. My best advice would be to know that that's the pattern. Again, nothing wrong with you know that it's coming those that increase in urges doesn't necessarily have to translate into just like complete submission to your ocd and just laying down and surrender 
Um, you can still fight. You can still bring the heat. Just be compassionate with yourself because you're probably going to be tired too. Um, probably not going to have like as much energy to kind of fight the good fight. Um, but know too that, that, that this will pass. Well, you know, like eventually you will feel more like yourself again until four more weeks roll by and then you'll probably feel that way again. But my, my, um, experience with people is that, uh, as they become educated about that issue and they start to like develop a plan and they start to resist more rituals and they just basically develop these muscles in treatment. Um, these four weeks, these four weeks where things kind of dip, they're not as like heavy of dips. They're not as deep of peaks, I guess, or, uh, of, uh, What's the opposite of a peak? They're not as low valley. as lows. Yes, the valleys aren't so low. Um, so maybe the first round of therapy where they're they experience that that cycle or those hormonal shifts, like they just are totally knocked off their feet because they're like, "What the heck is happening? I was doing so well. Like I don't feel like this makes sense to me anymore. I don't feel like myself." I educate them about it. I have this little discussion. Maybe four weeks from then, it hits them, but it's not quite as abrasive. We talk about it next four weeks, it's not as abrasive. And so I would anticipate too that as your exposure muscles um, and as your like OCD and anxiety muscles get stronger, it won't be as valley like in the future. Definitely be easy on yourself because it sucks. Colin, do you have anything to, to contribute to you that? Covered, you covered it. You covered it real well. <laughs> it was everything that you were going to say, wasn't it? Exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, it was everything that you were going to say. Um, okay, let's do this one. So, Priscilla, how do I confront a therapist that has deeply triggered my symptoms? A month ago, my symptoms went down by about 90%, but now it got worse than ever before. So, I am like, I want to get my hand in here, 100% guilty of doing this. And it's because we're human. I mean, it happens. It's really unfortunate. Um, but it happens. So... You know, I would say definitely to talk to your therapist about it, right? Like that would be my obvious number one kind of go-to suggestions. Hopefully you feel comfortable enough with your therapist to address it with them. Like, hey, that really triggered me. Like, can we come up with some type of plan? Like, can I understand why you did it that way? Like, I really just need to get this off my chest. Um, and definitely like honor that need to have that discussion. I think that's great. You know, it's a therapeutic relationship. You deserve to be heard. Um, and hopefully they can give you some type of explanation, even if it was just that it was an honest mistake, or maybe they, you know, maybe, maybe their interpretation was that they weren't trying to trigger you or that it wasn't a mistake, that it was just them talking and, and your OCD latched onto it. Either way, it's a conversation that you guys need to have so that you can kind of repair that and then ultimately figure out like, how do we work with you for this in the future? Right? Because how I handle it when I have triggered it, members and it happens it happens um because OCD and anxiety can be triggered by anything right so my quick go-to is like once we've repaired and once we understand each other and we're on a good page again i want to prepare them for the next time they get triggered because it's gonna happen again it's gonna happen again where someone triggers you if a therapist who knows your ins and outs can trigger you like that and send you from 90 percent improvement to now you're worse than ever before it was gonna happen, right? Like whether that was triggered a TV show or some conversation with someone else, like chances are obviously I don't know the details of this situation, but probably would have happened, right? Like if if uh, if a trigger could come in and knock you from 90% improvement to worse than ever before, I'm glad that you're still in therapy. Like I'm glad that this is a situation where hopefully you feel supported and you can have that conversation with your therapist so that you can repair that. So that when you get triggered again, which is inevitable because triggers are everywhere, you have that tool in your back pocket. Like this is how I handled, this is how I need to handle it this time. Um, I feel really strongly that therapy should teach you all that triggers are our responsibility. Like us being triggered is our responsibility because everything can be a trigger. So I don't put trigger warnings on any of my stuff. Um, and a lot of people who like are advocates in the OCD and anxiety community, like a lot of them don't because everything can be a trigger. Right. So it's, it's just, it's, it's tricky. So like I would, as, 
definitely, I would definitely have that conversation with your therapist, honor that part of you that deserves to be heard and to have an explanation and to repair that. With that said, know that it, it enables you so much and it empowers your treatment so much for you to learn how to deal with that trigger in a more effective way so that, so that it doesn't come down to one trigger that knocks you from 90% improvement to now worse than ever before so that you can own that and you feel solid in your recovery that nothing really can kind of sway you that easily. So there's definitely a lot that you could learn from this situation. And hopefully you have have the support and the good relationship with your therapist to help get you there. Um, Colin, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you definitely need to have a conversation with your therapist. Obviously, you're asking how to confront them. It doesn't really have to be like that. Uh, you can just be, I mean, therapy isn't supposed to be as honest as possible. Uh, the more honest you are, the better results you're going to get out of your therapy. And you also have to remember that at the end of the day, uh, you are the patient and you are paying them to assist you and to help you. And, uh, you know, you want to get the highest level of service you can. And what they don't know, they don't know. So you have to let them know that, you know, hey, this happened uh, after our last session. Uh, it really, you know, knocked me down uh many pegs and now i'm struggling again and uh you don't really have to necessarily play the blame game just just let them know what happened um and what they might have said that triggered it or done and uh work through it with them it's just an opportunity for you to grow your relationship with your therapist and have a good relationship with your therapist is very very important and it all stems from how honest you are with them Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, let's get to some others. Mm -mm. Let's see. So this is a commonly um, experienced one and, and I'm going to make it general here. So the best advice for suicidal obsession OCD, like the, it's really important for you all to know that the best advice for suicidal obsession uh, for suicidal obsessions is going to be the best advice for hit and run. It's going to be the best advice for sexual orientation. OCD It's going to be the best advice for harm intrusive thoughts, right? Like it doesn't matter the content, the content ERP is applied the same exact way, regardless of the subtype. So regardless of the trigger, regardless of the content, regardless of the subtype, um, we're still going to apply exposure and response prevention the same way. And so that's why I picked this question again. And Brittany, as I clicked your name, I know that I clicked on you twice. So sorry for everyone else. I didn't mean to, but I clicked this question because it's important to demonstrate that the best advice for suicidal OCD is going to be the best advice for any other type of OCD. And that's to try to do exposures, put yourself in these anxiety provoking situations and resist your rituals. So identifying the things that you do in an effort to reduce your anxiety as a result of the obsession and try to as much as you can resist those rituals. Try as much as you can to resist those compulsions, resist those safety behaviors. If you can't resist them completely, um, if it would be way too difficult, lead to a panic attack, um, then what you could do is you could try to reduce those rituals, right? So let's say that it would be way too difficult for you to just resist washing your hands completely after touching something, you could try to reduce those hand washes. Um, let's say that if you couldn't resist washing your hands completely, the idea of reducing them was still really difficult. Maybe you could just try to postpone it, right? So my advice is always going to come back to, regardless of the subtype, try to get yourself into some exposure-like situations. And importantly, try to resist the rituals or the safety behaviors that you do to try to keep yourself safe or protected. Um, or the things that you do to try to, you know, get sure or to become certain about things. If you can't resist completely, try to reduce or postpone. And I would always recommend, like Colin has recommended, um, I would definitely recommend just trying to find a specialist who works with OCD, um, who kind of knows the ins and outs and knows the sneaky tricks. So um, that's a very common one I've heard about. 
I haven't experienced it personally, but I like how you said to approach it like you would any other subtype. Uh, Cause I feel like it's not um, that, I mean, it's not, there's not really a difference. It's just the content and uh, yeah, ERP and uh, delaying and procrastinating. Uh, those are always negative things for a lot of situations, but for this type of thing, it can help out a lot and um, basically develop good habits into avoiding um, doing those compulsions and uh, rituals or whatever you're doing to try to ease your anxiety for that moment, uh, or what you think is working uh, and yeah, I don't have a whole lot to say on this one just because I haven't experienced it, but I think you touched on a lot of it. Cool. Awesome. Dun, dun, dun. Brittany, you're asking all of like the great questions that I would have <laughs> to just have because they're really good, but I, I have to pick on other people. <laughs> she says she starts no CD on Saturday. So right. I know. I hear a, a couple of people are. Um, and someone was asking, I can't see where it was, but if you, if someone was having a hard time, like accessing the informed consent. So if you're having a hard time accessing any paperwork out there, I'm not going to go back and scroll through, but just go to, um, your member portal. So if you go to www.nocy.com slash portal, I think it is, I'll find it. When Colin answers the next question, I'll find it. I will post it. Um, I'll link Lexi. Lexi, I will link you where to find it. Um, okay. Dun, dun, dun. I think you'll I think I think this one will be good for you because you have lived experience, right? And you've kind yeah. of talked about this. And this is this is kind of like a, a con I'm learning this is like a little bit of a controversial question. Yeah. Um, people think of this differently. So, and I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. Um, yeah. I think there are probably some wrong answers, but um, yeah. I think it's okay to just like have a talk about it. Kind of what do we think? So do people actually recover from OCD or will this always be so bad? I've been in therapy for six months already. I'll let you go first while I find I this. Think I can only see for six, is it six months? We said months at, right after. Okay. For some reason that doesn't show up on my end, but that gives me a better perspective. Uh, do, I would say people can recover and continue to be recovering. Um, basically, you can put yourself in a uh, recovering mode. I wouldn't say you're ever recovered from OCD uh, because it can always, you never know what could trigger it to come back. Uh, I don't want to sugarcoat it and say like you can completely, you know, just be, there's like a magic uh, thing that happens where you're completely recovered and you're back to normal again, air quotes. Uh, but you definitely want to stick with the therapy. Six months is a good amount, solid amount of time, but you need to make sure you're, uh, you're using your therapy sessions to the best of your advantage. Uh, you know, taking those tips that your therapist is giving you and using them outside of sessions. I struggle with that. Uh, where my therapist is like, I want you to do this and this and that. I'm like, Oh man, that sounds like homework. And I never did homework very well. Um, so uh, you have to hold yourself accountable and put in the work uh, to basically put yourself into a recovery mode. Uh, but I don't believe that anyone ever can be recovered completely. Um, maybe go through times where they're um, a lot better than they have been in the past, but um, it's something you're gonna have to understand that you're gonna have to live with uh, for the rest of your life if you truly have OCD. Uh, and it's something you have to accept, but the good thing about it is there's a lot of other people out there. Uh, I know obviously NoCD has a great community of people. I'm in a couple different Facebook groups of uh, people uh, with ha that have OCD, that have discussions and uh, 
you know, they're having bad days, they can post about it and people can interact. And uh, just knowing that you're not alone helps out a lot as well, Wes, with anything that you struggle with. Yeah, I, we are going from the same page. So um, I am also of the opinion that you can't, I, I, the one wrong answer that I feel like there is, is that you can cure OCD. I don't think that you can cure OCD, just like you can't cure anxiety or depression or like really anything else. Um, cure, I think implies that we're going to like go in your brain and like zap it out and it's just going to be gone forever. That's what I, cool. think of when I think of curing. Um, awesome. Doesn't happen that way. It'd be really nice. But until then, we are going to rely on the gold standard, um, the evidence-based practice of exposure and response prevention. And with that said, I think if we are to conceptualize OCD as, as obsessions plus compulsions, right, which it, we currently do, that's, they're part of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, I think if, we, if our goal is to not have intrusive thoughts, if our goal is to not have anxiety, to not have doubt, to not have uncertainty, then we are setting ourselves up for failure, right? Because intrusive thoughts are normal. We've done tons of research to determine that no matter where you're at in the world, you know, 95 to 99% of individuals claim and say that they have intrusive thoughts. My opinion is that the other one to 5% of people are lying or they don't understand the question. So intrusive thoughts are normal. Anxiety is normal. Anxiety is actually functional. If we didn't have anxiety, we would all be dead. Um, obviously it gets haywire, um, but, but we can never set our expectations to be that we're not going to have doubt, that we're not going to have uncertainty, that we're not going to have intrusive thoughts. We are going to have those things. What we can hope for and what we can aim for and expect in our recovery is to not do compulsions. Now, I do believe that everyone is capable, hypothetically, of not doing compulsions. Now, are we human? Sure, yeah, I give into safety seeking things every day. I give into what probably would have at one point been considered compulsions all the time. I think it comes down to, as far as recovery goes, how quickly do you rein that back in? How quickly do you kind of collect yourself, recognize that you're getting a little bit haywire, recognize that that train is gaining momentum and we've got to bring it back. That's recovery to me. Um, not necessarily the presence of intrusive thoughts or the presence of doubt, it's more so being able to have them and just be able to be okay with them and be okay with whatever is going on and still be able to do the things that you want to do anyway. And so I do think that people can go on to be in recovery and continue to be recovering. Um, but to me, that is just kind of living knowing that like you, you have to work a little bit harder than maybe the average bear to make sure that your brain doesn't go down this rabbit hole, right? Yep. So I think you can still live a completely meaningful and completely satisfying and fulfilling life. Um, I definitely think it's possible for people to no longer meet criteria for OCD. Um, so to meet the criteria for OCD, technically you have to um, be experiencing difficulties for an hour or more a day. Uh, I definitely think that people can get to the point where it's not taking that much time every day. Um, I definitely think that you can get to the point where it doesn't distress you, where it doesn't cause impairment in your life. So if I, I the answer to this, to this question depends on your expectations. Like, can you recover from OCD? Is OCD chronic is how I always hear this question being framed. And it's like, I, it's a, it depends. It depends on what you're, it depends on what you're saying. It depends on what your expectations are. If your expectations are to be rid of and to not have anxiety and to not have intrusive thoughts, sure, I guess that's what's chronic. But that's chronic for all of us, right? Like we all have instances of anxiety. We all, that's a, a universal experience. Um, we all have intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts are not selective to people who have OCD. They're not even selective to people who are more likely to have OCD. It's just, it's just normal. What makes OCD OCD is your misinterpretation of those intrusive thoughts as being significant. And then we go off to the races to do compulsions, right? So I think as long as your expectations are to reduce compulsions, to have a better relationship with anxiety and to be able to rein it back in versus I need to get rid of these intrusive thoughts. I don't want them anymore. Like, I don't think that's realistic. Um, 
And keep in mind too, like I know six I months. A, sorry, I'm laughing. I read a really funny comment. What? When hey, was, someone does like my red glasses. Someone else didn't like my red glasses. So see what? I, I, love, I, love, the red, I love the red glasses. You I don't think you have them. You can't please yeah. everyone. Everything in life is uncertain. Someone likes the red glasses. Someone didn't. Yeah, you didn't just, have those just last can't please everyone, right? So I'm going to keep wearing the glasses. Um, but yeah, so I believe that you all are totally capable of living totally fulfilled lives, totally satisfied and fulfilling lives. And it's going to knock you off of your game every day. That's, a, that's okay. You can still live a totally meaningful life that way. And maybe not even every day. If you can get to a point where it's not every day. Uh, or even for a span, I've had spans of times where it's like, I didn't even, you know, think about it, uh, about having OCD and it's, it was, it was great, but, uh, fortunately, you know, it's still there, but I was able to, uh, I'm able to understand when it does pop up again and what I have to do to, to deal with it. Awesome. Oh, Reddit. There was a really good one. So many people starting therapy. I'm so excited yeah. for you guys. So if you have any questions about therapy too, if you have any questions about no CD, what to expect. Something else I wanted to mention too, um, everyone would benefit from it, but we have support groups. So no CD offers free support groups. So um, Full admission our links have been a little bit wonky but we're working on bugs kind of in the background but we offer free support groups you don't need to be enrolled in no CD therapy services um, to enroll so if you go and download the no CD app um, you'll be able to find a little graphic I will even show you guys because sometimes people lose it but here it's just that fancy little image fancy little image introducing online support groups um, so yeah, you can go and register, they're free, no gimmicks, don't have to be enrolled in therapy services. Um, we have groups on uh, managing just OCD is just general. We have um, support groups for loved ones. So if you have loved ones who are wanting to learn more about how to support you with OCD, then we have support groups for them. We have support groups for young adults, for students with OCD, um, for religious OCD. For, uh, for OCD that has sexual or taboo content. Um, we're gonna add more for July. So if you go to the website and there's not a whole lot there, just know we'll be getting more in for July. But um, a really great resource, especially for those of you, and we have what what uh, made me remember this is um, we have a, re a new relapse prevention and maintaining recovery group. So if you've kind of been in therapy for a while and you're needing to uh, just maintain your recovery and you want to talk with other people who have kind of been at it for a while and you really want that specified uh, discussion about how to maintain your recovery and engage in relapse prevention, that would be a really great group for, for you guys. Um, we're also trying to do more weekend groups, trying to do more groups in general. So definitely keep checking out the app, keep checking out our website. Um, and No City is incredible. No City is awesome. So if any of you are interested, go to www.nocd.com, free 15-minute phone call. We'll get you hooked up. Let's do a couple more. Colin, do you have any that you want to see? I can show them. You can always shout one out, too. Let me see. So now put the pressure on Colin so you guys can be mad at Colin instead of me <laughs> for, not, for not picking. I would like to answer all of them. Let's see. If you can't find one, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Because I keep seeing, I don't want to pick somebody that's already been picked before. Okay, I did that. So I didn't mean to. Um, yeah. Only because two people asked about this, I think, at least two people, um, about the physical sensations that you experience during anxiety or like panic attacks. And so we can definitely chat about this. So. I can accept the anxiety slash exposure, but I still hate the physical discomfort that comes along with certain exposures. For instance, the um, feeling of having dirty hands, the feeling of fullness after meals, help. Um, so yeah, I, like if I were to meet criteria at all, it would definitely be like this. 
I don't like when my body is off. I like, that's why I made the comment about coffee. I never, I haven't drank coffee in like two or three years because I don't like anxiety. I don't like how it makes me feel. I don't like the shakiness. I don't like the sensation of it. Um, I don't like headaches. And so it's actually a little bit of an exposure for me to kind of drink, drink coffee. Um, but yeah, a lot of times people will struggle with the physiological sensations that accompany anxiety. So, and, and those are all normal, right? So when we get anxious, our brains have one function to keep us alive and to mediate risk, right? So when we get anxious, it's normal and it's expected for our bodies to jump into fight or flight mode, which is where our sympathetic nervous system basically ramps up, our blood rushes to our extremities to get us prepared to run away as if there was a bear, um, our, our respiratory rate increases, um, our heart rate increases, and so that can all be really uncomfortable. Um, but Colin experiences that. I experience that. My husband, who is the most laid back person in the world, experiences those feelings. That's not necessarily the issue. The issue becomes when we are so intolerant of those physiological sensations and we're so anxious by those physiological sensations that we get anxious, we feel the physiological effect of that anxiety. And then we get anxious about that. <laughs> and then we feel more physiological effects of that. And then we get more anxious about that. And you can see you kind of work yourself up into panic, right? Um, and so as much as OCD and anxiety has a lot to do with intolerance of uncertainty, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that concept before. Um, if not, definitely look it up, intolerance of uncertainty. It also has a lot to do with um, anxiety sensitivity. So anxiety sensitivity is this in a nutshell. So like hating the physical discomfort that accompanies anxiety. There's actually a test, like a little assessment called the anxiety sensitivity index that we used to give at people at my old job. Um, and it would be like, I hate when I get nauseous. I hate feeling full. I hate when other people see me anxious. I hate when I feel dizzy. And the higher that they scored on those items, the higher their level of anxiety sensitivity was and the higher their anxiety sensitivity was, the more we had to work on that in their exposure work. Um, and fun things, uh, we work on this the same way that we would work with other exposures. They're just called interoceptives. So you would literally, I mean, they're, they're literally body exposures. So the way that we would give you guys exposures to do things kind of in your external environment, you know, to touch this doorknob or to, you know, touch this or to look at this image, right? Like that's all exposure work for your external environment. You also have inter an internal environment that is in this example, you know, very anxiety provoking, the physical discomfort, you know, feeling of dirty hands, feeling of fullness, you know, other people get really worked up over shakiness or dizziness or headaches. Um, and so we do interoceptives, which are, like I said, body exposures, we would literally have someone like spin around in a chair for 30 seconds or hold their breath, breathe through a straw, um, do an all over muscle tense. Just like exposures, our intention is to put them in this position that is anxiety provoking potentially so they can practice feeling uncomfortable so that they can become less sensitive to that so that they can learn not only do those sensations pass as long as I don't engage with them, but I can also learn to tolerate it. That, that feeling of fullness is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. That that feeling of having dirty hands is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. And that I would almost, I would almost ask yourself too, I feel like in a lot of these situations, the fear is like, unless I ritualize, I'm going to feel this way forever. Unless I get rid of this, I'm going to feel this way forever. Unless I clean my hands, they're going to feel dirty forever and they're going to mess, it's going to mess me up and it's going to be on my mind and I, it's going to distract me. And if I don't just wash my hands, it's going to be there forever and my anxiety is going to increase catastrophically until the day I die. And, and that's obviously people consider they go and they wash their hands, right? Because they don't want their anxiety to increase catastrophically forever. But we have to check that because that's not possible. It's not possible unless you're engaging with your anxiety and unless you're ritualizing somehow, unless you're escaping the situation, your anxiety cannot increase catastrophically infinitely forever about the same thing, forever. Um, it, you'd sooner habituate. You would sooner habituate. You would sooner, you know, learn and get used to that. 
So um, I get it. Like definitely, it can definitely feel very anxiety provoking kind of in your body. And that can be kind of what maybe you're most sensitive to. I would then not only just incorporate that into the exposure, like that that's also something that you need to sit with and make sure you're not ritualizing through. Maybe try to even like lean into that a little bit more and try to prioritize doing more interoceptives, doing things that make you feel full, doing more things to make you have that dirty hand feeling and just really making sure that you're not ritualizing to get rid of those feelings, right? So I, it, it can feel uncomfortable. My hands can feel, trying to have the attitude of like, my hands are gonna, my hands can either feel dirty or they cannot feel dirty, but I'm still gonna go and do all these things that I need to do anyway. Um, I feel full right now, that's uncomfortable. I'm gonna go and do the things that I need to do anyway while feeling uncomfortable and try to try to teach yourself and let yourself learn you can feel uncomfortable and you can still go do those things anyway, because that's ultimately what treatment is all about, right? Like feeling uncomfortable, whether that's in your body or kind of just internally in your mind. Um, Colin, did you have any last minute thoughts about that one? Basically just, yeah. I mean, like you said, you have to be, become more comfortable with uh, feeling uncomfortable. So is basically what, what the name of the game is and it's uh like i was saying earlier it sounds a lot easier said than done but with anything the more times you uh do that and the more times you face that fear the easier it will be uh as you continue to move forward so yeah just being uncomfortable is a part of life and uh, you just have to work through it and get used to having those moments where you're uncomfortable and recognizing it, but still continuing to do what you need to do. Awesome. And so I'm typoing like crazy right now, guys. I'm trying to like answer questions. Yes, we do virtual support groups. Um, <laughs> virtual support groups app on the OC, not on the no CD app is what I meant to say. Um, yeah. So virtual support groups. Um, Colin, we have time for maybe one more. You want to do one more super, super quick. We could do one more. Yeah. That's fine. Cool. Um, well we have, let, how about what's your, what's like your favorite go-to resource for OCD or anxiety? Someone had mentioned the book rewire your brain. Um, I've not read it before. I know that IOCDF.org has a huge list of kind of vetted resources that I would recommend um, checking out if you want to know more resources. IOCDF.org is really great. But I guess as we wrap up here, Colin, um, we're at about that time. Uh, what is kind of your go to resource for OCD or anxiety? Uh, I wouldn't say like a resource, like a, like a book or a website or anything like that. My biggest thing is, uh, right now is, uh, being productive. Uh, I've noticed that the more productive I am, the more that I, you know, get up off the couch or the more that I, um, exercise, whether it's exercising, whether it's just cleaning, taking out the trash, uh, and basically it builds my confidence and the more confidence that I have, the better I am about facing my, uh, facing my issues with OCD, facing those, uh, those, uh, those doubts that I deal with on a day to day basis. So I would just say, and also therapy. I mean, I go to therapy. I have been seeing my therapist every two weeks, uh, almost since the pandemic started just cause everything went virtual and actually my insurance was just paying for it like a hundred percent. And that wasn't the case before. So I was like, I'm just going to go as much as possible. Uh, so yeah, utilizing my therapy therapist and also my psychiatrist because, uh, the medication that I have been able to get on has helped me a lot deal with my anxiety, um, and kind of soften the blow a little bit. Uh, and make things a little bit easier, uh, makes it easier to approach things. And I have a little bit less anxiety uh, from just the chemical imbalance in my brain. Uh, so it makes it easier to approach those uh, situations that I deal with uh, 
not just on a day to day basis, but on an hourly minute by minute basis sometimes. So, uh, but yeah, the support groups I've, I've uh, been wanting to do that a little bit more. I, like I said, I've joined some Facebook groups where I can, uh, offer my insight or, you know, post anything, you know, any questions that I have, like, has anybody ever taken this medication or what's your experience with this? And just being able to have a community of people, uh, that you can rely on and, uh, that helps a lot because you know that you're not alone in fighting this. There's so many people out there that are dealing with things and no matter how messed up or how taboo your feelings are or your, um, your fears are, there's other people that have had those exact same experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I've had some really bad, bad thoughts and things that I've, my mind has tried to convince me is true. And, uh, it was hard to share them for, I held them in for a long time and didn't share them with anybody. And that made it worse. And as soon as I was able to share that with somebody they're like, Oh, that's like really common. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, it is. I was like, I didn't know that. So I thought, you know, I was the only one dealing with this because also your OCD, you know, you know, it's a bully. It makes you think that you're, you know, the only one dealing with this and they want you to, and it wants you to, feed into those compulsions and those behaviors and those, those patterns. Uh, and you just have to break that cycle and continue to, um, basically be a warrior and fight against it every day. That's what I call you guys. Whenever I have people from the community who have OCD, I, I call them warriors. Yeah. It's really, I, I mean, it's really, it's kind of what it is. Yep. Um, well, let's go over one more time, Colin, one more time where people could find you in case they want to keep up to date with you. I know your website, how can they find more about you and, and just everything that you do for the community? So everything is on, uh, yeah, on www.moderndayoverthinker.com, uh, or just at modern day overthinker. That's the app for the Twitter, the Instagram. I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook for the most part. Uh, the Twitter I'm working on a little bit more, uh, and TikTok I've been inconsistent, but I want to get back, back into that. One of my friends is helping me out with that. She I'll find you on TikTok. Yeah. It's the, it's the same, same username. Uh, so, um, you will be, I'll be like, we can be each other's like one follower because. Yeah, I haven't had anything take off yet, but uh, I need to be more consistent because that's what TikTok's all about, it seems like. Well, social media in general, but uh, but yeah, uh, at MD Overthinker on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, but yeah, the website has all the links, moderndayoverthinker.com. And uh, yeah, I, get, I share uh, some personal stuff on there. Uh, you can find me pretty easily. Uh, I need to add my name to the, some of the bios just so people can, if people want to reach out to me personally, they can. If you have any questions or, you know, are dealing with uh, some issues. Uh, I also talk a lot about recovery uh, from addiction. Uh, I am in recovery. I've been in recovery for four years now. Uh, so I like to be able to be a resource for that as well. And there's a lot of people out there, especially over the last year that have been struggling with their addiction and wanting to get clean. And there is a way to do that. So I can help out with that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So awesome. And if you guys want round two, um, I'm going to be on Colin's um, Instagram for an Instagram live at 815 central time at night. So that's after my support group that I run for no CD. So I do the support group um, for no CD every Wednesday from seven to eight. And then I will be hopping on 815 central time with Colin. So um, if you want to see that head to his Instagram on Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday at 815 central and we'll have another chat. Yep. Just yeah. continuing to talk about OCD. I love awesome. It. Cool. Well, Colin, thank you guys so much. And 
you know, we've ha we've gotten really good feedback, really good comments. You guys have been super supportive of each other and giving each other good feedback in the group um, chat. So I really appreciate you, Colin, for being here, sharing your story and giving us your feedback about questions. Um, and I will see you on Wednesday. All right. Sounds good. Bye, good everybody. Bye, Colin. Bye.